Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you are watching the Real World NP YouTube channel. We make weekly episodes to help save you time, frustration, and help you take the best care of your patients. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about pap smears. So first, I'm gonna start with some context that is helpful to know and fun to know, but um, also helps to educate our patients. Next, I wanna jump into interpretation, some potential results that you might see on a pap and what to do with them, plus my favorite resource, and a little bit about the management pieces, like the management, it gets outside of the scope of primary care, like we won't necessarily be deciding that management, However, it's important to know and like understand how that process works so that we can adequately counsel our patients and support them when they're going through that process. So first up, I wanna talk about some context. So cervical cancer screening, um, PAP screening, is the sampling of cervical cells to assess for cervical cancer. Uh, it currently stands that in uh, the screening guidelines, there are a number of screening guidelines in the US, which may be a topic for another video of like which, which um, organization to follow their recommendations, but another topic for another day. But the USPSTF, United States Preventative Services Task Force, um, recommends cervical cancer screening starting for patients with a cervix starting at ages 21 to 65. So for patients who are 21 to 30, those patients are recommended to get cervical cytology every three years. So what that means is just a sampling with a cyto brush sent to the lab, cells only, every three years, if it is normal expected findings. For patients who are 30 and above, as it currently stands, is that they can either do continued cervical cytology testing alone, only looking for cervical cells, um, they can do combined uh, co-testing of cervical cells as well as HPV, the virus, human papilloma virus, or that's every five years, or they could do HPV testing by itself every five years. So those are the screening recommendations. So I wanna get into a little bit of background though, just so you can help counsel your patients. So cervical cancer is actually, when it comes on the list of co top causes of cancer in the United States, it was about 19. Number one is breast cancer, as about 20 times the number of cases and deaths-ish. Don't quote me on the deaths, but incidents, definitely about 20 times. And um, so it's like, oh, like why is there this like big thing and stressor about cervical cancer screening and why is it so rigorous and all that stuff, right? Obviously we wanna take care of all of our patients um, and all the different types of cancers. For context, in countries that don't have cervical cancer screening, it's the number two cause of cancer and death in patients with a cervix, right? So that's why we do cervical cancer screening. That's, that's why it's number 19. So since we've implemented cervical cancer screening over the last 50 years, I believe it's both morbidity and mortality or, or incidence of mortality rather has decreased by about 75%. So it's way lower in the, in the United States where we have that general testing. So a little note about HPV. So there are about 40 types of human papilloma virus. 15 of them are the most serious ones, the highest risks being the, the 16 and 18 one. It is the 99% um, of cases of cervical cancer are also are caused by HPV. It's the number one cause of cervical cancer. So that's why we care about it. Kind of two pearls about it though. Most of the time by the age of 30, patients have cleared it on their own. It's a, it's a sexually transmitted virus that we are exposed to and our immune system can get rid of it or it cannot get rid of it. So that's why we don't test for HPV under the age of 30 is because we, if it's going to be there, if they have it, it's still going to be there. And that's, it's like, okay, great. We'll see how they feel and, and how we test when they're age 30, because it's not actively causing issues at that time, which it leads me to the other pearl, which is that um, it takes about 15 years, 15 years for it, for cervical cancer to progress to severe. And so that's really also important to let our patients know when it comes to the screening guidelines, as well as the management guidelines, is that even if somebody has HPV, it's not necessarily going to turn into severe cervical cancer before 15 years has elapsed. And then another little factoid is that about 50% of patients with cervical cancer have never had a pap smear. Hopefully this is helping, right? And this can also help your, you have those conversations with your patients who are like, do I really need to do that? I haven't done that, blah, blah, blah. So who's at the highest risk for cancer? So um, about 10% of 
of patients with um, cervical cancer haven't had a pap within five years. So that's why we have that five year mark. Patients who are born outside of the US or have only been inside the US for the last 10 years also at pretty high risk because again, different screening guidelines in the US versus worldwide, lower socioeconomic status and not connected, patients who are not connected to healthcare definitely are at higher risk. There's also racial and ethnic disparities. So um, as you may or may not know, race is a social construct. It's, it's a poor proxy for genetic um, familial and genetic history. And it's not like, it's, it's, just, it's just a social thing. It's not like a biological thing. So, but however, there are trends uh, for patients who identify in various racial and ethnic uh, groups. So the highest, um, there's a higher incidence of both cervical cancer and mortality among Latino Americans, non-Latino Black Americans, as well as American Indian and Alaskan Native patients. So those are the highest risk patients or highest incidence in mortality, followed by um, non-Latino white Americans and lowest incidence and mortalities among um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans. So those are just important things to note, right? So when you're just keeping in the back of your mind as you're um, working with patients, because at least in the context of primary care, there's like so many boxes to check and so many things to think about all the time. Like, oh, I forgot to do that cervical cancer screening, right? Like I forgot to do their pap, right? They're due for their pap, I'll get it next time. That happens, right? That's normal, that's okay. And also like, let's keep this in the front of our minds that like, this is the reason why we have it under control in this country, right? Okay, so let's jump in. So that's the context, just some helpful information. Let's get into interpretation. So when you get a PAP result, you're gonna be looking at the cytology as well as the HPV results. I've already said with HPV, there's about 40 kinds. There's the higher risk kinds. On the result, it will let you know this is a what type it is and this is a high risk kind, right? The next part is like the cytology, like what kind of cells we're looking at. The most common and important ones to look at are those squamous cells. So typically the kind of quote unquote normal result is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, normal, or there's an epithelial cell abnormality. Those are the two kind of like branching points, those two options. If there is an epithelial cell abnormality, there's gonna be a couple of different options. Before I get into those options, I wanna share my favorite resource. So the guidelines for management of abnormal PAPs is through the um, ASCCP. They have the guidelines. Their, their algorithms are a little complicated to use and understand sometimes. However, they have developed an, developed an app. It's about $10 a year. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I do use it myself and I love it and I recommend it and it's worth every penny. So definitely check that out if you are obtaining PAP samples and interpreting them and managing them. Um, and you want some help with that, kind of like reading through their different algorithms, which can be very like mind-bendingly confusing. But this tells you exactly what to do. Beautiful, right? So when it comes to HPV, you just put in those results, that part, and then they'll handle that, right? The app, the guidelines will tell you what to do. The next piece is, um, again, those results of the squamous cells. So I love this image. Um, because I think for me, when I was a student and becoming a new grad, I was like, I don't really understand all of this like alphabet soup of letters, but when I can see what it looks like, then it's a lot more helpful. So the first step in terms of abnormality is something called ASCUS. So it's atypical cells of undetermined significance. It's a mouthful, but basically it's like, it's, it is what it sounds like. It's just, we don't know, it's slightly abnormal, but it's like not really anything specific enough to like tell you more. It's just something that you wanna keep an eye on because it could develop into those later stages, right? Again, cervical cancer, severe cervical cancer can take 15 years to develop. Next step in terms of that going up this, the scale of like more abnormal looking cells is low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, LSIL. Next step is high grade. So it goes A tip, A ascus, low grade, and then high grade. High grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So those are, that is HSIL. You may actually see squamous cell carcinoma on your pap. I have never seen that. It is an option. And basically what happens when you get those results, the HPV results and the ASCUS, LSIL, HSIL, you plug in the information in the app, plug in their age, and then it really just spits out what you do next. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you do next for the abnormals, but I wanna pause and, and talk about a couple of different other things you might find on your pap sample that are a little bit tricky. Okay, so one of them that comes up, it's not all the time, I think it's like 10 to 20% actually is like the, the stats that I found. Something, it's called absent 
endocervical cells slash transformation zone. That might look different on your labs. It might be like worded a little bit differently, but basically that transformation zone, that squamal columnar junction, I'm really good at mispronouncing things, but hopefully I got that one, um, is, is a high risk for neoplasia. So we do want to see that on a pap sample. However, it can not be there and that's okay. So ASCCP recommends, it depends on their HPV result. If their HPV is negative or it was not obtained because it was not indicated because they're under the age of 30, you just return to regular screening. If they do have HPV, you follow those guidelines, but it's not necessarily a need to like immediately repeat it. It can be uncomfortable. It can feel uncomfortable to do that, but those are the guidelines. It's a little bit controversial, but there's not enough data to suggest that those patients warrant more testing because it could lead to more problems, right? Um, you may also see um, something called glandular cell abnormalities. I'm not going to get into the, each of the specifics in this episode, but um, uh, definitely like that is an option. And it's kind of similar to the squamous cell ones where there's different levels of like how severe it is. We always want to look into glandular cell abnormalities. So just, just more of a story. Just remember that piece. Two other things I want to talk about. One is about sampling. So excessive blood or excess, excessive lubricant can really obscure the cytology. And so you want to be mindful, a little clinical pearl here, is being really mindful of what kind of um, lubricant you are authorized to use by your supervisor. Sometimes there's specific types of lubricant that is more amenable to uh, cytology. And sometimes you just have to use like a lot less. Like you don't want your patients to be uncomfortable, but at the same time, we don't want to interfere with the sample and then they have to repeat the test again. That's like more, maybe even more uncomfortable. Who knows? So um, the next thing is about um, like uh, bacterial findings or other organism findings. This happens a fair amount. I'm not going to get into every single thing that you might see, but I'm going to touch on the most common ones that I see in primary care. So um, the moral of the story when it comes to an organism, most of the time you want to clinically examine the patient and pursue the appropriate diagnosis for that indication, right? And basically what I mean is like, just because you find it on a pap doesn't mean they have it and that you treat it for the most part. I'll get into some specifics. So trichomonas, the specificity is high enough that it's reasonable to treat trichomonas if you incidentally find it on a pap. However, you may see something, uh, it might be worded differently. I've seen it worded differently in different places, but basically it's a shift in bacilli suggestive of BV. The consensus is that it's not, that's not sufficient enough to diagnose a patient with that. So you want to clinically assess them and then consider further testing. And it doesn't always turn out that they have BV. It's just in that sample. You want to just investigate that further before you like snap treat them. Um, you may see things like reactive changes and in inflammation. That doesn't necessarily mean much. And it doesn't, it, and according to my research, um, uh, further testing is not indicated. So, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go down this rabbit hole of like, oh my gosh, they have a hidden infection, that kind of thing. So actinomyces, pretty sure I'm saying that right, is a um, bacteria that is a normal gastrointestinal flora. It is especially seen with patients who have an IUD and it's a little bit controversial, but the thought is, is that it's a colonizer. And what you, again, moral of the story is you wanna assess the patient and then you wanna see like, do they have clinical symptoms? Uh, do they have symptoms suggestive of, an, of PID? And then you want to do a vaginal culture for actinomyces if you're going down that route. Um, but I saw, you know, it looks like there's differing opinions based on like, do we always culture everybody who comes up with actinomyces versus is it a really clinical assessment of do they need it or not? And you just let the patient know. It's kind of a patient guided decision making process. Okay, so I want to touch a little bit on the management. So like I said, I always use that ASCCP app and um, it's really helpful for like step one, two, three, four. Most of the time when patients have an abnormal pap, they're going to first do a colposcopy. If you haven't had the pleasure of observing a colposcopy or performing a colposcopy, I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I love procedures and I do mean that sincerely, the pleasure of doing it because I love procedures. Although I do acknowledge it is not like a very comfortable procedure for patients. And so it's a little bit hard to watch in that way. Um, but basically it's an extended pap exam. I do recommend that you shadow one if you haven't had the opportunity so that you can kind of counsel patients appropriately. Um, even if you don't end up doing them yourself, you can. 
If you do, sorry, let me pause there. If you do want to do this, I do have a number of family medicine colleagues who have gone through this training to observe and do their own about 25 times with supervision, and then they are allowed to do it in the clinic setting. I have not had that opportunity because of limited uh, need for colposcopy in my clinic and not in a need for another provider and extended training, et cetera but you could if you wanted to. Anyway, um, so colposcopy, you could do it in primary care if you have somebody who's trained, or you can send them to gynecology. And it's an extended pap, and they use a variety of different um, like liquids and like acetic acid, and they're looking for, like they spray acetic acid on the cervix, and then they're looking for like little white spots, and then they look with a green light, and then like a different light. I don't know the whole procedure, but like basically it's like a bunch of whole liquids. They look with different lights, and then they take little samples of a biopsy. Um, they don't give them anesthesia, which is um, indicated. I don't want to go on a tangent there, but it's not like that's pretty standard um, for a variety of reasons, but it's basically just a very a uh, quick pinch of tissue and it's not very comfortable for patients, but it's also, anyway, it's not very comfortable. Um, the other thing that they'll do is a sampling of the endocervical cells that is not very comfortable, but it's basically like a uterine sound, only it's with a special brush. When you get the colposcopy results from those biopsies, you might get a result called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, so CIN. So if you look at the image of the abnormal cells, when it gets to that really abnormal stage, it's not quite to the place of cancer. This is still a pre-malignant lesion, and levels 1 to 3 determine how severe it is. For those patients, there's a procedure, there are two different kind of treatment options. Basically what we're trying to do is prevent those pre-malignant lesions from turning into cancer. And so there's kind of two different options. One is an excision procedure and one is an ablative procedure. So there's two main uh, excisional procedures. One is called a cone, one is called a leap. Those are nicknames. So it's a cone bi biopsy, also known as cervical conization. Um, cold knife conization. Those are all the different names for it. And you can Google a picture of it, like not like a real patient, because that might be not your thing, but you could do an illustration. They have them. But basically they're taking a sample of the cervix to get rid of those cells. This is under general anesthesia in a day surgery type of setting. The other option, um, LEAP, is a loop electrosurgical excision procedure. It's just the same procedure done slightly differently. Again, also under general anesthesia. Um, and then the other option is something like cryotherapy, like that ablative type of thing. There's a couple of different treatments for that. But most of the patients that I see in primary care have either that loop or cone, uh, leap or cone procedure. So, um, so yeah, so that is, that is my, my spiel about PAPS. Hopefully that is helpful. If you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll get these episodes sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and bonuses I really just don't share anywhere else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hang in there. I'll see you soon.